To those of you who don't know me, I'm Patrick O'Brien, I'm the General Counsel of the uh, University of Johannesburg. Uh, it, it, this evening it is my honour and privilege to welcome you on behalf of the Vice-Chancellor of the University to the professorial inaugural lecture of Professor Veli Matova. Um, I wish to express a warm word of welcome to all of you, the loved ones, the special ones, the colleagues, this is, of course, a proud and joyful occasion for us here at UJ. And uh, Professor Matova, a very, a very landmark moment for you. Um, and uh, I wish to acknowledge uh, all the members of Senate and academics who are here this evening and all, everyone else who's joined us for this uh, illustrious occasion. Uh, as to the special guests of uh, 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 Professor Matova, I welcome her parents, Dr. Jadina Matova Silga. I'm sorry, I didn't meet her before the end. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, welcome here. Her father, Mr. Colin Silby, and her uh, friend, Professor Samantha Weiss. Uh, so, welcome here. And of course, also welcome to our distinguished professor, Professor Tad Metz, who will uh, deliver the response to the inaugural lecture. Um, the inaugural uh, uh, lecture of a professor is a public ceremony in which newly appointed professors are inducted into office and deliver the inaugural addresses. The ceremony has its roots in the medieval university and it serves multiple purposes. Firstly, it is an expression of welcome uh, and an entry for new professors joining the circle of colleagues who are already uh, full professors. Secondly, it provides a platform for the professors to display their expertise in the discipline and showcase their research. Thirdly, it stands out as a moment of pride and celebration for the incumbent, his or her family, fellow scholars, the university and society. It is a celebration of the achievement of a major milestone as well as uh, contributions made to the discipline and their ultimate impact on our society. Uh, this evening we are gathered to bear witness to the entry of Professor Mitova into the illustrious community of scholars at the university. We will listen to her inaugural lecture as one further step in the journey of being a professor. This is a journey and does not uh, end once this lecture has been given. It is a self-reflective pause in the journey of the professor with the promise of more to enrich our minds and simultaneously contribute to the rich intellectual body of work in the discipline. Professor Mitova, we are looking forward to your address, and I invite the Acting Executive Dean for the evening, Professor Camilla Naidu, to introduce uh, Professor Mitova to us. Really, Boha, Sia Bonga, Donkey, thank you. Good, good evening, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, family of Veli Mitova. So I have the pleasure of reading uh, Professor Mitova's narrative CV. Veli Mitova is head of philosophy at the University of Johannesburg, a co-founder of the African Center for Epistemology and Philosophy of Science, and the South African team leader for the International Geography of Philosophy Project. Between 1996 and 2000, she studied philosophy, literature, and maths at Rhodes University, where she also obtained her master's in philosophy, literature, um, where she also obtained her master's in philosophy with distinction in 2002. She received her PhD without corrections after three years of reign from Cambridge University in 2007. Before joining UJ in 2015, she proved that the world doesn't have it in for philosophers by managing a nine-year feat of post-doctoring at Rhodes, 2007 uh, to 2008, the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico in 2009, and the Universitat Wayne in 2000, between 2009 and 2015. Veli is an epistemologist by training and used to trade in rather abstract ideas and reasons for belief. But nowadays, she finds it increasingly exciting to cross over to ethics, harnessing her epistemology work into the service of our South African concerns. 
At the moment, she's thinking about the decolonization of knowledge and epistem epistemic injustice under the auspices of a Newton Advanced Fellowship for the project Epistemic Injustice, Reasons and Agency. She is the author of Believable Evidence, published by Cambridge University Press in 2017, which received the UJ Vice Chancellor's Distinguished Book Award in 2018. And she's the editor of The Fact of Turn in Epistemology, published by Cambridge University Press in 2018. Epistemic Decolonization, Special Issue of Philosophical Papers in 2020, and Relativism, the Special Issue of Inquiry 2020. So before, I, um, before we, we, we convened here today, I asked uh, Elva Rodney Gomede, how would you describe Veli? And she said, um, I think the best description of Veli is that she's the most energetic and enthusiastic member of our faculty currently. So Veli, that's a compliment for you. Thank you very much, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Ilva, for the compliment. Um, and thank you, everyone. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that one. Um, thank you very much to all of you for coming. Uh, it's, a, it's an extremely special occasion uh, for me, uh, not just for the, for the reasons that Prof. Brian mentioned, but also because I managed to dodge all of my graduations uh, because I was never a person of ceremony. So thank you for supporting me in this. This is a, car a karma moment for me. Uh, with, with this one. Um, my colleague Henny always says that it takes a village uh, when, when we have an, a particularly difficult student. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure you'll agree that if it takes a, a village to raise a, a child and a student, it takes an even bigger one to, to raise a professor. Um, and in my case, it seems to have been particularly uh, a difficult this task. Uh, because it took a very, very big village indeed. Uh, but fortunately, most of my most important villagers are here tonight, um, and I would like to, to say a word of thanks to, to, to some of them at least. Uh, I start with my family, um, who are really wonderful people. They're, they're so wonderful that sometimes it's annoying to have them because no achievement really feels like an achievement when you get so much out of your family. Um, and I'd like to particularly highlight my mom here, uh, who's been an amazing friend uh, and um, with very timeous, sometimes not so timeous, parental prods. Uh, so, so, so thank you for this. I know everyone thanks their mom because they think she's the best, but mine really is the best. So. <laughs> um, um, if the village had a, a knighthood for making professors, it would go to, to my knight in shining armor. But he hates public acknowledgement, so I will not tell you of all the amazing <laughs> things he has done um, to raise this professor. But we know you're there. Um, the UJ philosophers. Everyone knows how amazing the UJ philosophers are. But no one knows how amazing it is to be every day with them. Um, with my colleagues, thank you for your support and for your wonderful just being a wonderful family for me, um, intellectually speaking. And our students, uh, you guys are awesome. Like your laughter in the corridor just makes it an even better family. Thank you. Um, and finally, thank you to UJ, uh, who have provided this great home for us. Um, and it's been so good that not even all this 4 IR talk has spoiled it at all. <laughs> so thank you. I have lots of mentors and early inspirations that have, I've acknowledged in, in the booklet that, that you have. I won't mention them except for Samantha Weiss. Um, don't draw any conclusions about her age because of this, but she was one of my earlier inspirations because she was my tutor uh, in, in my first year. Thank you. The talk then. Um, I'm going to claim that um, a certain kind of relativist thinking is a very bad rationale for decolonizing knowledge. Um, and I'll try and keep it as unphilosophical as possible. Um, I had 
uh, a colleague from a department that will remain unknown, uh, watch our video the other day from philosophy and say to me that she would love to do philosophy, but we use such obscure long words that she just can't take it. So I'll, I, I won't, I'll explain all the obscure long words that I, I use, or I hope I will anyway. So I will claim that relativism is a bad rationale for decolonizing knowledge. Um, what is relativism? You'll be quite sick of the idea by, by the end of the talk, but, but very simply put, it can be summarized in this odious phrase that there's such a thing as your truth and my truth. Uh, there's no objective reality out there. It's just uh, you and me and what we think is just good enough, even if we think different things. Um, and, and the best way to understand it, I guess, is, is by, in, in contrast with its um, uh, uh, opposite, which is absolutism, and that's the idea that what we call your truth and my truth is actually just your story and my story. There is an objective reality out there, uh, and there's the truth. Um, and what you think and I think can be better or worse at reflecting uh, what the truth is. So that's what relativism is. Um, Decolonizing knowledge uh, is, of course, a very complicated subject in its own right and can, and can be a philosophical subject uh, in, its, in itself, uh, what we might want to mean by it. Um, and, and it's certainly a great buzzword, so, uh, in, and it's most extreme. It's the idea that um, all scientific concepts are actually Western constructs uh, and they should be jettisoned. Um, more moderate, moder moderately, uh, there's the, the call to decolonize education, uh, the way we, we run um, our research, uh, science itself, uh, and closer to my home anyway, uh, philosophy. Um, and people can, can decolonize all sorts of things, uh, such as even feminism and, and uh, other such things. Um, we can have uh, a call to decolonize institutions. Uh, and uh, most recently, this is the year of indigenous languages. Uh, and uh, we can have the call to indigenize the languages at the university. So all of these things are suggestive, but what is decolonization, the decolonization of knowledge? Um, again, we can disagree about exactly what it involves. Uh, but I think that it can be characterized uh, by three core ideas. Uh, the first one, that it's something essentially tied to the wrongs uh, of colonialism, in particular the epistemic wrongs, so the way it has marginalized and silenced knowledge systems uh, and conceptual frameworks that don't fit its own. So that's the first core, core characteristic uh, of the, the decolonization of knowledge. The second one is that it involves um, reclaiming the right to think and theorize from our own point of view, uh, rather than the colonial one imposed on us. Um, and the third one is that it requires us to acknowledge more than one kind of knowledge system as uh, epistemically authoritative. So uh, in line with uh, my promise, uh, by epistemically authoritative, uh, I just mean that uh, something that has a, a claim to being genuine knowledge. So these are the, the three core features uh, of decolonizing knowledge on, on which most people would, would tend to agree. And I'm going to focus on this third feature tonight because this is going to be the, the relativistic one, the one that's going to make trouble, I think, for relativists. So here's the plan. Uh, first, I'm going to, to focus on the rationale a little bit more. Uh, the, relativist, the relativist rationale that I have in mind. Um, I will then, then distinguish various kinds of relativism um, and I will, um, these are their implications for decolonizing knowledge um, and I'll finally conclude that none of them works as a rationale for decolonizing knowledge. So here then is a standard, uh, sorry I'm keeping an eye on the time because people have been very strict about the timing. Um, so here's the, the standard rationale for decolonizing knowledge that I have in mind. And it starts like this. Colonialism has set up um, a single perspective as the one that gets to say what counts as knowledge. So certain forms and certain things that, that are supposed to count as knowledge, like indigenous knowledge systems, don't. Um, what counts as rationality? 
So according to this perspective, uh, some of us are rational, while others of us are emotional and intuitive, especially when we say no. Um, irrational, uh, mystical, uh, and generally in need of cognitive upgrading and civilizing. The same perspective gets to say what counts as science. Uh, so which questions and practices count as, count as non-scientific? So these, for example, count as non-scientific. Uh, well, these, for some obscure reason, perhaps because they involve a, a sharp instrument, count as scientific. Um, again, the same uh, perspective gets to say what counts as philosophy. So which questions and methods are genuinely philosophical and which aren't? So, uh, this guy over here is not a philosopher, not a real philosopher anyway, whereas this crazy guy over here apparently is a philosopher par excellence. Apologies to the Wittgensteinians. Um, and so, so basically, the same perspective gets to say what counts as all of these epistemic goodies, knowledge, rationality, uh, philosophy, science, everything. And needless to say what this perspective is, sorry to put it rather uh, bluntly, it's the pale male perspective that has dominated uh, uh, the, the West, Western world and unfortunately others as well. So, so that's the first step of the rationale, to say here's this perspective that's been uh, shouting the odds on what counts as these good things. The next step is to say that this perspective, which sells itself as objective and neutral and gains its power from selling itself as objective and neutral, is in fact just one amongst many, many valid perspectives. Um, so, uh, so here you get people um, uh, like philosophers of education saying stuff like, people need to accept that there's no one unique truth which is fixed and found, but rather a diversity of valid and even conflicting versions of a world in the making. So this is just one perspective amongst others. Um, and excluding these other perspectives amounts to a kind of epistemicide. So it, 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 that's a very dramatic way of talking about silencing and exclusion, right? And some people disagree that that's the appropriate way to talk about it, uh, but, but I, I don't, so I'm going to use this label. So excluding these perspectives amounts to an epistemicide. Uh, therefore, decolonizing knowledge requires at the minimum that we grant or, or, or take these perspectives to have equal uh, epistemic authority or equal, an equal claim to, to being knowledge. Um, so here's another uh, theorizer of, of um, education uh, who's an example of this, who says, in advocate, uh, advocating for the reversal of epistemicide, we necessarily seek to place indigenous knowledge systems of the concrete people uh, of South Africa on the same level of parity with other epistemological paradigms in order to achieve both substantial and formal equality. So that's the, 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 the rationale that I have in mind, roughly. So I promise not to use uh, long words, but I can't help myself, and I will use premises uh, in a conclusion just to pinpoint exactly uh, the, pro the, the, the problematic premise in this rationale. So um, it goes like this. So the first premise says, colonialism has set up a single perspective is epistemically authoritative. This perspective is in fact just one amongst many equally uh, legitimate ones. So colonialism has committed a kind of epistemicide by setting up this single perspective. Um, and therefore, if uh, we're gonna decolonize knowledge, we must, uh, at the minimum, take different epistemic perspectives to have equal epistemic authority. So let me, let me go through, through, through this uh, argument uh, and show you where the problem is. Uh, obviously there's a problem. So I don't think that the problem is going to be with the inferential moves. So um, if colonialism has set up this perspective as uh, epistemically authoritative, and if this perspective is just one amongst many equally uh, legitimate ones, then I think that uh, colonialism has committed epistemicide. Again, we can quarrel about the word, uh, but certainly it has done some, some genuine wrong. Um, and again, the move from uh, the C1, so, so I'm going to grant this move. Uh, the second move from the sub-conclusion to the conclusion, if indeed colonialism has committed epistemicide, then decolonizing knowledge must 
involved the reversing of this epistemicide and the granting of equal authority to all of these perspectives. So I don't think there are any problems uh, with the inferential moves in the argument. So that leaves us with the first premises, with, with the only premises. Um, and the first, the first claim is an empirical claim. So uh, uh, it's obviously, it's literally speaking false, right? So uh, it's, it's literally speaking false to say that colonialism has a single epistemic perspective, a single unified view of the world or of science or anything like this. Obviously, people have very many different views. Um, and uh, uh, there's not a unified one, but I think that we know what, what the premise means, at least in spirit. There is a single perspective that's been more or less imposed on us uh, ever since the civilizing mission. And that perspective has indeed dictated on who gets to, to, to count as knowledgeable uh, and, and so on. So I think that while we can fight about the exact phrasing uh, of the premise, and the spirit is, is spot on. So this leaves us with, with this second premise, this idea that this perspective, the colonial perspective, is in fact just one amongst many equally legitimate ones. And that's going to be where uh, the relativism is going to kick in. So how do we understand this premise? What, what do people mean when they say, um, I said it earlier, equally valid uh, ones? Well, what do they mean? So what, one way of hearing this premise is, what well, the most radical way of hearing it, is uh, so-called metaphysical relativism. And that's just a view that there's no objective reality out there, but there are other various perspectives that make up competing uh, and equally legitimate realities. So really, there's nothing out there that we can uh, really, the way we normally think about stuff, there is a reality out there, and we somehow reflect this reality. That's wrong. No, it's my truth and your truth, right? So here, these three realities, uh, they're different. They just share this idea that Africa is at the center of all of them. And suppose that we're trying to explain why Bob is sick. Uh, and then, according to you and your community, he's sick because his uh, lungs are damaged by smoking. And then, according to me and my community, he's sick because he's being cursed. Uh, and then, ac according to Lindiwe, uh, he's sick because this one's for Alex. His relationships with others uh, are unhealthy. Um, so, sorry, the cartoon was for Alex, not the unhealthy relationships. <laughs> <laughs> I, should, I should mention. Um, Okay, so, 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 that's, so that's the idea. So there are these competing realities and comp competing perspectives. Uh, and then it's these competing perspectives that decolonizing knowledge requires us to take, to give equal epistemic authority to. Um, so just to summarize the view, there's no objective reality, various perspectives make, make up different, uh, but equally legitimate realities. And it's these perspectives that decolonizing knowledge requires us to give it equal epistemic authority to. Um, and many people sound like they really mean this quite radical view. So the, the earlier quote that I gave you uh, is one example. People need to accept that there's no one unique truth which is fixed and found, but a diversity of valid and even conflicted, conflicting versions of a world in the making. OK, so your truth, my truth. Now, this kind of relativism, uh, you, you, I mean, I've <laughs> There's a one-on-one -on -one move against it that I, I, I'm embarrassed to say I find quite gripping, uh, but fortunately, uh, uh, there, there are ways around. But let, let me introduce it to you, and it's the idea that, that uh, this kind of relativism is self-refuting. So it, it goes like this. Look, relativism says there are no objective truths out there. Right? But this claim itself purports to be uh, an objective truth. So relativism is self-refuting. And uh, so Tad pulls this move against, uh, in a different context, against the relativist rationale for uh, Africanizing uh, the curriculum, so, so, or at least a version of this move. And, and I think that, that we can, even despite its grippingness, right, uh, we, can, we can find ways out of it, the, the relativist can anyway. Um, and let, let me start with the, with the least plausible way. So the least plausible way, I think, is uh, what, what, what is known as local relativism. And this is the idea that 
there are no objective truths within certain domains of knowledge. So for example, you can say there are no objective truths within science. So you replace that first uh, move with uh, there are no objective truths within science, let's say. Uh, but there are other objective truths uh, at other levels. So the objective truths about reality itself, right? Such as one star. Um, and the objective truths about what uh, uh, morality requires of us, which will become uh, important shortly. So you can, you can say something like this if you want to save yourself, if you're a relativist and you want to save yourself from the self-refutation charge. Um, and then you block, obviously, the conclusion because you no longer have this general claim about there are no objective truths, but I'm selling this as an objective truth. Um, and I, 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 f I find this way out really, really weird uh, for several reasons. Let, let me share two. The first one is, why would reality have these objectivity gaps? Right? So we are we ask, we ask to imagine reality as a kind of Swiss cheese, right? Where there are these solid objective bits, and then there's nothing, right? And there's like relativity, and then again solid, and then again relativity. So, so I find it hard to imagine what, what a reality like this would be like. Uh, and maybe that's just a point about my imagination. So, so let me make another one. Um, that this kind of move is really strange uh, for dialectical reasons. And that's because usually people are relativist about morality and value, but they accept objectivity about facts. So, um, so this is uh, for, the, for the sleeping little philosophers. Uh, if you, unfortunately, I didn't know they were going to be here because uh, it's, it's rather sick. But uh, so uh, we can agree when you look at this that uh, there's a fact of the matter. There is duck on Donald Duck's plate um, and, and his little ducklings. So people think that that's a solid fact, whereas it's far more dubious to think about whether uh, claims such as it's wrong to eat duck for Donald Duck to eat duck and, and he ought not to eat duck. Right? Uh, people would, would tend to think that that's more of a my truth and your truth uh, kind, of, uh, kind of thing. So, so we usually think that the first kind of statement is a more factual statement and we should be objective about that kind of statement, um, whereas the second kind of statement is more a matter of your truth and my truth. Whereas the current way of bailing out uh, uh, relativism is actually doing exactly the opposite. So that's, so that's quite, quite awkward. Um, so, so I think that's why I said that this is the least promising sort of way for the relativist to, uh, to save herself from the uh, relativist charge. F sorry, from the self-reputation charge. One more that's more promising, and that's uh, the conceptual relativist uh, who would say something like this. Um, look, various cultures have different conceptual frameworks because they have different concepts. So a nice example is the concept of illness and health. So uh, Godwin Segal, for example, gives this uh, example for um, the Yoruba concept uh, of illness. Uh, and he gives just a couple, I mean, it's a very nice discussion for those of you who would like to read it. Uh, but, but I'll just isolate a couple of features of this concept that will show that it's a very different one from the Western one. And the first feature is that um, for, for the Yoruba, uh, health and illness are holistic concepts. So they include the totality of physical, social, and psychological, um, and spiritual well-being. Um, and the subject of illness and health is the entire body and the entire being. Uh, and one sign of this is that diagnosis never actually starts with, uh, with the body or with an examination of the body, uh, but rather with an inquiry into one's divine relations and one's social relations. Um, and thirdly, um, and consequently, that causal explanation will offer feature both the natural and supernatural. So, um, for example, it would, it would, and we had an example earlier uh, where we say that someone is sick both because of smoking and because their ancestors are unhappy with them. So, so the, the point of all this is that there will be many cases in which the statement Bob is ill will be true for certain language speakers like the Yoruba but not for other language speakers like, like the Westerns, Western languages. Um, so we have these situations in which one statement will have incompatible truth conditions, as we, as we want to say. 
Um, now, uh, my colleague Zintle assures me that I'm making a mistake here, and if we get subtler about our concepts and we distinguish uh, illness from disease, sickness, and so on, uh, I leave all this to, to the philosophers of medicine to sort out, because I think that they are really uh, concepts that, that will result in this. So this, this is just a point about the example, rather than uh, about uh, about the availability of different co concepts across frameworks. So the, the whole point then is that different cultures have different concepts, and sometimes these will be, in well, I'm not going to use the big word incommensurable, they'll be incompatible, just not to, to annoy the philosophers of science, they'll be incompatible, so uh, uh, when, when you have statements featuring these concepts. And then while there may be an objective reality out there, uh, then the thought is there's no way of stepping outside these perspectives. There's no view from nowhere from which to adjudicate between incompatible claims that feature these concepts. So it's not as though when, when I have the Yoruba concept of illness and you have, have the English concept of illness, whatever, however that goes, um, there's, there's no way that we can step outside these conceptual frameworks to say who is right, whether Bob is ill or not. So that's, that's, the, that's the idea in a nutshell. Um, and hence, to go back to the, to the decolonization story, because of this, because of, these, the, because of there not being a view from nowhere to arbitrate, we should treat all perspectives as having an equal claim uh, to, to counting as knowledge. So I promise not to, not to abuse you with the, with the epistemic relativist. There's a third way uh, along similar lines. So, so let me just do a quick catch up. So, I've had a look at, at uh, three kinds of relativism. Metaphysical relativism, uh, according to which there's no objective reality, but incompatible uh, perspectives constitute equally legitimate realities. Uh, then I looked at the kind of Swiss cheese model, which is, which is that there, there are some objective truths, but not others. Um, and finally, the conceptual uh, relativism, which says that there may be an objective reality out there, but there's no way of uh, arbitrating between competing versions of this reality. Okay, so what? So, so what, <laughs> what, what about decol then? Like, wh what, what do these kinds of relativism uh, bode for decolonizing knowledge? Well, I think that metaphysical relativism, the, the, the idea that there are no objective truths out there, uh, would be a terrible rationale for uh, decolonizing knowledge. Primarily because if there are no objective truths out there, then there's no objective imperative to decolonize knowledge, right? Um, and I think that this is totally unacceptable uh, because uh, proponents of decolonization rightly insist that an objective wrong has been committed and it ought to be redressed, objectively ought to be redressed. They don't think that, uh, we don't think that. It's like, okay, it's epistemicide, according to this framework, but nice job according to this framework, right? We know it was a nice job according to this framework. The whole thing that we want is tools for being able to say that this framework is wrong. Um, so, so, so I think that this way, the metaphysical relativist, is a complete non-starter as a rationale for decolonizing knowledge. Uh, next one, local relativism, the Swiss cheese kind of relativism. Uh, at least here, it's better because we can have an objective imperative to decolonize knowledge. Uh, but I think that according to this view, we should only decolonize certain disciplines on, on relativist grounds. At least metaphysics and ethics, uh, so this is just speaking about my discipline, sub certain dis sub-disciplines in mine will not be places where we can uh, urge decolonization on relativist grounds. So uh, remember, according to this view, their objective meta-truths such as what reality is like, and that's the, the, the domain of metaphysics, uh, and moral truths such as what decolonization requires. So, so then we should motivate uh, decolonization along different um, grounds uh, if, if you're a local relativist. You don't have the resources to push for decolonization for all disciplines. And finally, the conceptual relativist, uh, this idea that different cultures have different concepts and there's no view from nowhere to adjudicate, uh, I, I think that uh, the view is going to imply that no perspective is epistemically superior to other perspectives, which is great news because that's, you know, that's what the, uh, uh, 
the decolonization rationale is trying to, to show. But um, I think that if superior epistemic perspectives, sorry, if the possibility of, of superior epistemic perspectives is undermined, then uh, I think that so is the, the concept of teaching across different disciplines. Sorry, different perspectives, incommensurable perspectives. Um, and I think that the reason is that the whole concept of teaching presupposes that I, I'm giving you something. When I teach you something, I'm in an epistemically superior position with regards to this topic, to you. And so if we undermine the possibility of superior epistemic perspectives, then I think we undermine uh, the concept uh, of teaching across incompatible perspectives. So I think, I think that this is uh, quite a ropey argument, actually. So, so let me give you another one. Um, uh, I think that if we undermine the, the possibility of a superior epistemic perspective, uh, we can't adjudicate amongst, amongst competing curricula, at least, on purely epistemic grounds. Uh, right? So the whole idea of, of adjudicating amongst curricula on, on epistemic grounds would be to say, look, we should adopt this kind of curriculum because it reflects reality better, or something like this. Uh, but if we can't say that kind of thing, we can't say that kind of thing on the current proposal, on the local relative, on the conceptual proposal, because um, there is no such thing as a superior perspective on reality. We can, of course, adjudicate amongst curricula on moral grounds. We can say, look, morality requires us to reverse the wrongs of colonialism by teaching this curriculum rather than this one. Or we can do no pragmatic grounds. We can say our grants will be cut off if we don't teach this rather than this. But we can't um, do it on epistemic grounds. How much you care about this, of course, is another issue. I do as, a, as an epistemologist, but, uh, but, but there we go, we're weird. Um, so uh, it's not just a personal preference here, because I think that it would go against the, the grain of what decolonizers propose, which is Look, people, we've cheated ourselves of genuine forms of knowledge, of superior ways of perceiving reality. So, so I think that that's why it's not just a personal preference on my part, uh, but, but I think that it would, it would tend to not sit easily with the kind of uh, thing that, that uh, decolonizers want. So if this kind of conceptual relativism uh, tends to undermine the concept of teaching across perspectives, and if it tends to undermine the idea that we can adjudicate amongst curricula and epistemic grounds, then this will be a terrible rationale for decolonizing academia at least, right? These are the two core things of academia teaching and what we teach. Um, so I think that it, it's not going to, to work that nicely. So, so let, me, let me draw a quick map of what just happened and, and then show you uh, uh, where we are. Um, so, so if you think that there's an objective reality, you'll be like on the one side of the spectrum. Um, and then if you think there's no objective reality, you'll be on the other side over there. Uh, and then you can think that there are some objective truths, whatever that means. Um, and then if you think that there is an objective reality, it can be a conceptual or an epistemic relativist. I didn't talk about the epistemic relativist. Uh, and then if you think there's no objective reality, you'll be a, a, a metaphysical relativist. And then in the middle, I, I don't know what exactly to call it, but you can have various versions you can, be, uh, you can be an absolutist about metaphysics, but uh, a, a relativist about science, and uh, you can be more absolutist and relativist about other, other things. Uh, either way, the implications for decolonization are that over here, uh, at conceptual relativism, you get an objective imperative to decolonize, but you undermine uh, certain central academic uh, ideas, like, like teaching and uh, the choice of curriculum. Um, in the middle here, you can get uh, only the imperative to decolonize certain disciplines. Uh, and then here, I said you can get an objective imperative to decolonize, but the view is, is, is slightly weird. Well, actually, it's very weird, but, but anyway, let's call it slightly, that'll be enough. Um, and then um, under the metaphysical relativism, you just don't get an objective uh, imperative to decolonize. So where does that leave us? Um, remember the point of all of this was to, to have a look at a certain kind of rationale for decolonizing knowledge uh, and, and to show that it doesn't work. Um, and I isolated this, this middle premise, the idea that the colonial perspective 
is in fact just one amongst many equally legitimate ones. Um, and I conclude uh, that there's no way of hearing this premise in such a way uh, that it's both plausible and it supports decolonization. Thank you. I've been allotted seven minutes, but I'm taking ten. Um, I doubt I can do justice to Professor Matova's career in ten minutes, but uh, I'll do it uh, less injustice if I take ten minutes than if I take only seven. Um, I'm going to first sing her praises a bit more than has been done so far. Uh, and then I'm going to discuss uh, the inaugural address that we just heard. I'm going to contextualize it a bit. Uh, I'm going to add some friendly amendments. And I'm also going to criticize it a wee bit. Um, and when I criticize, I'm not being a jerk. Uh, I'm just being a philosopher. Uh, uh, this is what we do <laughs> uh, uh, when we uh, uh, respect another uh, uh, philosopher's position and thought. Uh, our way of taking it seriously is to run with it and see where it goes. And so I'm going to do a bit of that. Um, in a lot of ways, uh, I think uh, uh, Veli Matova is the ideal uh, South African uh, academic. Um, uh, basically, she came back. Uh, so I remember her uh, in the early 2000s uh, at Rhodes uh, being an extremely bright master's student. Uh, and when I uh, learned she was going to Cambridge, it just occurred to me, look, go. Uh, go get your fancy degree. Um, uh, but bring the education uh, and the skills uh, back to South Africa. Uh, uh, and I uh, take some pride in being partly responsible for her being here. I was head of department. Uh, uh, when we decided to offer her the job and uh, uh, was the one who was uh, uh, happily uh, gave her the phone call in Vienna uh, some years ago that I'm sure we, uh, we both fondly remember. Um, thankfully, she's come back uh, uh, and is helping with uh, what we might call the South African project, uh, uh, which uh, uh, at least at its best is a matter of constructively uh, finding ways to respond to the oppression of black people. And we saw a taste of that uh, uh, with uh, her critical exploration of uh, decolonization uh, in her inaugural address. But I want to point out that her work on this topic uh, isn't what has grounded her full professorship. Um, uh, it's relatively recent uh, that she's become interested in these topics. I mean, recent in the last few years. But what really led to her being awarded a full professor um, uh, 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 was really a matter of what we might call core uh, analytic uh, epistemology. Uh, and that gets summed up in this booklet with simply the phrase, having worked on, quote, abstract ideas on reasons for belief, unquote. Uh, uh, that's not enough. Uh, it just doesn't really capture uh, the kinds of contributions uh, Professor Matova has made uh, to epistemology. To get, a, to get a handle on that, it's going to help the non-philosophers if I tell you a bit about what philosophy is. Uh, I think philosophy is by and large well understood uh, as inquiry into fundamental and important issues that are transcend the sciences or underlie the sciences in some way. So I do ethics. Uh, uh, a scientist will describe the way the world is or uh, the way human, human beings are. But I will prescribe, as an ethicist, uh, the way the world ought to be or the way human beings ought to interact. Uh, uh, our former dean, uh, uh, Broadbent, uh, does work on causation. A scientist will say one thing causes another, but uh, 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 former dean Broadbent will step back and say, well, what is it for something to be a cause uh, as opposed to a mere correlation between two events? And uh, scientists will say they've got evidence. Uh, uh, for a certain claim. And more usually, scientists will say you ought to believe based on the evidence. But Professor Matova uh, is the one to step back and ask questions such as, what is evidence? What makes something evidence in general? 
And should we believe merely on the basis of evidence? Uh, uh, when we should believe on the basis of evidence, why? What should, what's, what's the motivating factor? So it's those abstract uh, considerations uh, in epistemology that have really uh, driven uh, Professor Matova's work, uh, as far as I can see, uh, for a number of years, uh, and that have grounded some important publications. To give you a very quick glimpse uh, of her contribution to the question of what is the nature of evidence, uh, prior to her work, there were two major views. On the one hand, the suggestion was that evidence is a matter of facts, something external to us out in the world uh, that we may or may not be aware of. On the other hand, uh, there was a second view that was very internal, uh, uh, that evidence is something, uh, is a matter of our psychological states and roughly our beliefs that are justified at a given time. And Professor Matova argues powerfully against uh, both perspectives, against uh, the more external perspective that evidence is just a matter of facts. It's, uh, 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 that doesn't give us, doesn't make sense of the respect in which we access evidence, or evidence is ours. And when it comes to the internal perspective that evidence is just a matter of uh, uh, whatever our justified beliefs are, uh, she points out that justified beliefs might be false. But surely we don't want to call false claims evidence. So her creative uh, and novel approach is to say, suggest that what evidence essentially is, is to believe our beliefs that are true. Uh, 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 in that respect, uh, she's able to maintain that uh, uh, evidence is something we access or have. It's a matter of beliefs, but not just any beliefs or not even the beliefs that uh, uh, are justified. It's the beliefs that are actually true, that map on to the way the world actually is. Uh, the view is original and uh, plausible and powerful and has lots of implications uh, for epistemology. Uh, including uh, the second major uh, question that Professor Matov has addressed about whether we ought to believe uh, based on evidence. What you think evidence is is going to influence quite substantially your answer to that question. I wish I had time to go into it. She's published in these, on these topics uh, in important uh, influential places. Uh, we did hear about her two books with Cambridge University Press. Uh, if CUP isn't the very best press in the world, it's you know, the top two or three, uh, uh, unquestionably. In addition, uh, uh, Professor Matova has published articles in journals such as Synthes, Inquiry, uh, and Philosophical Studies. Uh, and uh, for those of you who don't know the field, it's hard to get published in these places. Uh, 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 characteristically, uh, uh, these journals reject 90% of submissions or so. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Avelli's published in them repeatedly. In addition, uh, Professor Matova is leading a collaboration with Rutgers University, in particular the Department of Philosophy at Rutgers. Uh, and by the most authoritative source we've got on the ranking of philosophy departments globally, Rutgers is probably second uh, in the world uh, after NYU. So Professor Matova has uh, really, with her work in epistemology, raised the stature of UJ philosophy uh, and is to be commended. With my last few minutes, I want to say a bit about her inaugural address uh, uh, about uh, decolonization and uh, her critical exploration of what is probably the dominant approach to it, which is an appeal to uh, relativism, as we saw. She sounds sympathetic to the idea that the metaphysical relativist uh, 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 refutes uh, him or herself. According to the metaphysical relativist, recall, there are no objective facts. But the thesis of metaphysical relativism is posited by the relativist as an objective fact. Oops, uh, that's a problem. So what Professor Matova does is look for other kinds of relativism that don't look like they refute themselves and draws out their implications for uh, the decolonial project. Um, and on this score, I guess I want to say a couple of things. One is that I suspect the alternatives that she thinks avoid self-refutation uh, still ultimately uh, are vulnerable to that kind of problem. So they don't refute themselves in the way the metaphysical relativism does. Right? The metaphysical relativist says uh, 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 there are no objective facts, but that itself is supposed to be an objective fact. It's a problem. But one of the kinds of relativism uh, Professor Matova thinks avoids that is epistemic relativism, this idea that, well, there might be objective facts out there, a fact of the matter about whether the Earth is round or flat, um, 
but uh, uh, different societies, different cultures, different uh, languages um, are going to have uh, uh, different standards about what counts uh, as evidence or justified belief. Uh, and there's going to be no way to choose uh, uh, between these different perspectives. I think uh, that's going to spell trouble also for that kind of relativism. Even the epistemic relativist, the relativist who says uh, uh, justified beliefs are relative to different competing backgrounds, when the person advances that very claim, uh, she wants it to be a claim that we all should believe. That is, she thinks regardless of our cultural background, we ought to believe the thesis of epistemic relativism. And so it also, I think, uh, is self-refuting, albeit in a different way than the metaphysical relativist. Uh, Professor Matova suggests, uh, apart from considerations of self-refutation, though, uh, we've got reasons to reject any form of relativism as a ground for decolonization. And I find quite powerful uh, uh, her consideration. She points out that even if epistemic relativism is true, uh, uh, then we can't learn from each other. Uh, uh, then it follows that the African tradition, for example, has nothing to teach uh, those in the Western tradition because they've got different epistemic standards and different conceptual categories. But, so decolonizers want to suggest, there is something important to learn from the African tradition. Uh, I, I found it a powerful argument. I just want to close by saying a little bit more about what a kind of non-relativist decoloniality might look like. Uh, if we're going to be absolutists and we're not going to be relativists, how can we avoid the sort of colonial picture that Professor Matova painted at the very picture of the talk, which set itself up as one true authority, one single perspective, uh, that of the pale male, or the dead pale male in particular? I think what would help at this point is the suggestion that for any longstanding culture, there's some reason to think it's got some insight into the human condition. Right? If a particular culture or people uh, have been inquiring into a subject matter for several centuries, uh, surely they've got something right, something plausible about the state of humanity. Uh, I think that's enough to make sense of an absolutist decoloniality. That's enough reason to think uh, that the African tradition has some insights on the one hand, and that the Western tradition has some insights uh, on the other. Oh, I happen to think uh, that the dead white guys uh, did a pretty good job when it came to the nature of gravity. Newton and Einstein, and especially Einstein, uh, 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 pat them on the back. Uh, they seem to have done pretty well. However, uh, looking at the African tradition, I'm particularly impressed uh, by uh, uh, its moral and political uh, approaches. And in particular, we should be aware of uh, uh, its approach to conflict resolution. Uh, and if we look at the Paris uh, climate change talks in 2015, uh, uh, we find 200 countries having come to a unanimous agreement in about 48 hours as a result of using conflict resolution techniques uh, uh, that the Zulu people uh, uh, tend to use when they uh, undertake, uh, engage in, uh, in Daba. Uh, South Africans uh, had something there uh, to teach the rest of the world about how to solve difficult practical problems. I think it's an attractive picture, uh, this idea that we have something to learn from Africa on the one hand, and we also have something to learn from the West on the other, uh, and that it makes sense and avoids the problems of relativism that Professor Matova has so compellingly uh, laid out. So I thank her uh, for having come back to South Africa, uh, for having come to UJ, uh, and for having joined my department. I'm honored. Uh, to have you uh, join the full professoriate here. Thank you. Mr. Mitrova, I would like to call you forward so that we can rope you.
um, as we come to, to the end of the ceremony, uh, allow me again, Professor Mitova, to congratulate you on having achieved this momentous milestone in your academic career, your uh, inaugural lecture. Your lecture demonstrated your exceptional ability to profess your knowledge, giving new insights into a theme that we've been grappling with at, at UJ for some time. Um, and you emphasize that as we grapple with decolonization, we cannot ignore the philosophy that underpins it. Um, uh, to address the challenge, we need uh, uh, the academic insights of uh, uh, people like yourselves and Professor Nates and others, and uh, we value that. Uh, your promotion to professor confirms the high level of scholarship you have already achieved, and I personally look forward to observe your leadership associated with a position within Senate and other structures of the university. And thank you for allowing us to be part of your journey. I would like to invite all of you to uh, uh, join us for refreshments, which will be served in the venue to the left as you leave the council ch chambers. And thank you again very much for attending this very, very great occasion. Thank you.